Lux presents Hollywood. The Lux Radio Theater brings you Gene Arthur and Fred McMurray with Beulah Bondi in Remember the Night. And our special guests, Bob Hope and Rita Hayworth. Ladies and gentlemen, your producer, Mr. Cecil B. DeMille. <laughs> Greetings from Hollywood, ladies and gentlemen. This is Christmas week, and our holiday present to you is the play called Remember the Night. It's all tied up in a glittering, glamorous package, and the gayest decorations of all are those two bright stars, Jean Arthur and Fred McMurray. Christmas is a time when all wanderers think of home, a time when we appreciate most the warmth and the gladness of home. And Remember the Night, adapted from the Paramount screen hit, is the story of what home meant to one man and one girl at Christmas time. The man is a prosecuting attorney, and he's trying to send the girl to prison. But Christmas calls a strange truce in their conflict and throws a magic spell over them both. You'll hear Fred McMurray as the prosecutor. He played that part in the picture. And Jean Arthur will be the girl on trial. Their story has more spirit of Christmas in it than almost any modern play I've read. It's told in a new way and a sure way to our hearts. Remember the Night is a story of what makes the wheels go round in American life. Ordinary American life. A way of life that won't be stopped by anything. This national theater, we're proud to say, is part of that life. And so is the product that keeps this theater going, Lux Flakes, which also helps to keep your household going year in and year out. With the weatherman off the air, you may not know if you're going to have real snow for Christmas or not. But you can outdo the weatherman by whipping up an indoor blizzard for your Christmas tree with these speedy little flakes. Anyway, winter or summer, you'll find Lux Flakes breaking the speed limit to make the American way of life a little smoother. Now the spotlight turns to the center of the stage as the curtain goes up for the first act of Remember the Night, starring Jean Arthur as Lee Leander and Fred McMurray as Jack Sargent, with Beulah Bundy as Jack's mother. A jewelry store on New York's Fifth Avenue. In the glittering showcases, a thousand precious stones sparkle in their brilliant settings. Although it's just a few weeks before Christmas, this afternoon, there's only one customer in the store, a pretty girl in costly furs. On her wrist is a diamond bracelet, placed there by the enthusiastic clerk. He smiles happily, sensing that the sale is practically complete. Glorious, madame, isn't it? One of our most beautiful bracelets, really. Yes, it is beautiful. You won't regret taking it, madame. <laughs> I'm sure I won't. Well, what's the price, please? Only $5,000. 5000 That's reasonable. I think I'd like to see one or two more before I make up my mind. That one in the lower tray, please. Let me see there. Of course, madame. Personally, I prefer the one you're wearing. But this one's quite beautiful, too. The emeralds set the diamonds off very nicely. Now, if you'll just place this one on your... Madame. Madame, where... She's gone! Mr. Meyer! Police! Jones, what is it? That girl, she went out the door while my back was turned. She went out with a $5,000 bracelet! <laughs> Calling car number 17. Pick up girl, 23 years, dark complexion, silver fox furs. Search for diamond bracelets stolen from Meyer and Company. That is all. Hello? Officer Cassidy reporting to headquarters. We picked up that girl. Yeah, caught her cold with the goods in a hawk shop over on 3rd Avenue. I'll bring her in now. District Attorney's Office. Just a moment. Who is it? Commissioner's office. It's about that acquittal yesterday in the shooting case. Oh, tell them I'm busy. Hello? Can the district attorney call you back? Thank you. Is that all they have to do, beef about acquittals? Now, let's get going, Tom. Okay, boss. What's the first case today? Nah, it's a cinch. Dame by the name of Lee Leander. Cops a bracelet out of my and company and hocks it on 3rd Avenue. Open and shut. First offense? Nah, she's got a record. This is a third offense. Oh, that's good, that's good. First offender at Christmas time is tougher than tiger meat. Let's look at that chart. Conviction's only 78%. It was against 82% last year. Hey, boss, can I handle this case? I'll get your conviction. Uh, nothing doing, Tom. Your face isn't right to prosecute a woman. We'll get Sergeant on this one. Sergeant? What's his face got that mine hasn't got? Oh, whatever it is, he never lost a case for me yet. Yeah, but he's gone home for Christmas. 
Ohio or Oklahoma or someplace like that. Now, listen, I could get you a conviction so quick that you... Take it easy. Uh, Oh, Miss Day, get me John Sargent on the phone. Yes, sir. Mr. Sargent! Mr. Sargent! The telephone's ringing. Well, answer it, will you? I'm trying to get packed up in here. Okay, I'll answer. Hello? Hey, wait a minute, Rufus. Listen. Huh? If that's the office, tell him I've already left, huh? Oh, okay. Uh, hello? Yowza. Yowza. Well, if this is the office, he's already left. Oh, you blockhead. Give me that phone. Well, I only said what you told me. Shut up. Uh, <clears throat> good morning. Who all wants to speak to Master Sergeant, please? Oh, hello, Sergeant. Who do you think you're kidding? All right, never mind. Who is this? This is your boss. It's a good thing you didn't take up acting for a living. Yeah? Well, what do you want? We got a case to try this morning. I'll see you at the office in 15 minutes. Now, wait a minute. I'm supposed to be going home for Christmas. Oh, sure, sure, sure. You can leave this afternoon. Yeah, but I got 730 miles to drive. You told me I could... Now, look, Jack, don't argue. It's a female case, and I need you. Now, come on. Oh, I was afraid of this. Who's defending? Oh, Larry. That windbag? He'll give us the Gettysburg Address, the Declaration of Independence. Oh, no, he won't. I'll have Tom meet you in court, and you'll be out of there by noon. I'll get right down here. Goodbye. But listen, boss. Hello. Hello. Oh, Leary, you talk all day, all day long. When you leaving, Mr. Sargent? Shut up. Yes, sir. Quiet, please. Proceed with your summation, Mr. O'Leary. Thank you, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, you've heard the prosecuting attorney, Mr. Sargent, attempt to prove that a valuable bracelet was stolen from the premises of Meyer and Company by the defendant. All of this has been a waste of time, ladies and gentlemen, Time we could spend to better advantage in last-minute Christmas shopping. I know that's what I'd like to be doing. <laughs> May it please the court, we object, Your Honor. The jury's Christmas shopping has nothing to do with the case. Objection sustained. I withdraw the illusion, Your Honor. Ladies and gentlemen, the state has gone to great lengths to prove that Anna Rose Malone, sometimes known as Lee Leander... And sometimes known as a lot of other things. ...did on the afternoon of December 3rd walk out upon Fifth Avenue with a bracelet which was still the property of Meyer and Company to prove something she freely admits, as if the proof of this fact constituted a proof of guilt. Ladies and gentlemen, we must not be hoodwinked by circumstantial evidence. The contents of a whiskey bottle... Hey, Jack, I don't like the smile on that jury's pan. All juries get soft-hearted at Christmas, Tommy. Yeah. If you ever get a case to prosecute and you see that peace on earth, goodwill to men look come in their eyes, get a continuance, even if you have to fall down and tell the judge ate green apples. Uh ...is necessarily an evildoer. How flimsy is this argument? How unfair! But on it and because of it, you have been asked to take away the liberty of a fellow human being. The truth is simple. The bracelet was removed during a temporary loss of will and consciousness, now known as schizophrenia, but formerly known as hypnotism. Holy mackerel, that's a sweet one, hypnotism. Shut up, Tommy. You mean you're not going to object? Shut up, he's just postponed the case till after Christmas. Huh? How do you figure that? Hypnotism. Ah. Yes, I said hypnotism, and that is exactly what I meant. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, this girl, this poor, unfortunate creature, went into that jewelry store not to buy, not to steal, but only to look. A salesman showed her the bracelet, begged her to examine it under a more powerful light, and then excused himself. The young girl stares at the bracelet. Closer, closer. The great central stone flashes blindingly in her eyes. Blue, green, purple, orange. Suddenly the colors are gone. Everything is dark. A breath of cold air brings her to her senses. But what's this? Where is the jewelry store? What is she doing on Fifth Avenue blocks away from Meyer and Company? She doesn't know. Her mind is a blank. And why? This girl, this poor, unfortunate creature, was a victim, an unwilling victim, of hypnosis. Your Honor, the defense rests. All right now, Tommy, watch. Your Honor. Yes? Your Honor, the hypothesis of hypnotism is a very interesting one. But unfortunately, I am no Svengali. Nor are you, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. The people of the state of New York will require the expert testimony of Dr. Kindmuth, the psychiatrist. For this purpose, the people request that a continuance be granted till after the Christmas holiday. We object, Your Honor. The defense is already summed up. Objection overruled. The defendant will remain in custody, subject to giving a $5,000 bond. And all jurors, parties, and witnesses are instructed to return to the court January 2nd. Court adjourned, and a very Merry Christmas to you all. Thank you very much. 
Just a minute, Sergeant. That was a dirty trick you played on me. <laughs> it means another day in court, and I don't get paid for the state. I have to earn my money. No more sense of humor than a gravestone. Well, Merry Christmas, Francis. Now, take it easy, Miss Let Leander. me go. I want to speak to my lawyer. Mr. O'Leary, this guard says I have to have a bond to stay in jail. That's right. Is it right? You ought to know, Mr. District Attorney. I'm afraid it is. Well, how can I get a bond? I haven't got any more money. I don't want to spend Christmas in jail. Please don't let him do that. What do you mean you haven't got any more money? What have I been talking for, to hear my own voice? If you hadn't talked so much, I'd be out of here right now. Hypnotism. That gag so old has got whiskers. Oh, please, don't let him keep me here over Christmas. What's the difference? What could you do if you haven't got any money? I could walk around, couldn't I? Come on, miss, it ain't as bad as you think. You get a nice little room, a nice turkey dinner on Christmas, all the trimmings. Never mind the build-up, let's go. I hope you have a Merry Christmas, Mr. Sergeant. Hey, she's kind of sort, you, Jack. Yeah. Say, uh, Tom, on your way out, send Fat Mike in here, will you? Fat Mike the bondsman? If you know any other Fat Mikes, you can send them, too. Okay. Hey, Mike. Eh? Mr. Sergeant wants to see you right away. <coughs> Joshua, coming. Hello, Mr. Sergeant. You want to see me? Yeah. What do you charge for 5,000 bail from now till January 3rd? Did they pin something on you, pal? It isn't for me. It's for the young woman who was just here. Ah, I see. How much? For a friend of yours, nothing. Not a red Samalka. I didn't ask you for any favors. Favors? It's a privilege. You're still living at the same place? Yeah. Why? How soon you want her out? Right away. Okay. She's out. Thanks. So long. Hey, Rufus. You got those other grips packed? Rufus! Yeah, I am, boss. What's the matter with you? She's here, boss. Who's here? I don't know. Well, then how do you know she's here? I just let her in the living room. You let who in? Uh, the, the lady. What lady? I told you I wasn't home to anyone. Yes, sir. I told him that. But he shoved the door open anyhow and pushed the lady in with, with his compliments. Who did? A man, a fat Ike. Fat Ike? Uh, yes, sir. You mean Fat Mike? Yes, sir. He, he sure ain't thin, Mike. Well, what did, what did he bring her here for? I don't know. All right. Guess I'll have to go and speak to her. I guess you will. <laughs> well, hello. Hello. What are you doing here? I don't know yet, but I got a rough idea. Well, anyway, I'm glad you're out. Sure. Now, what do I have to do for it? Well, for one thing, you could say thank you, but if that doesn't fit in with your plans, just skip it. My motives in this matter are... Here you are, boss. Here's the drinks. What drinks? I didn't tell you to bring Scotch any... and soda, miss. Thanks. A drink, boss? Get out of here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I know. <laughs> you know, one of these days, one of you boys is going to start one of these scenes differently. And some girl's going to drop dead from surprise. What are you talking about? I suppose you do this with all the lady prisoners? Oh, yes. My life is just one long round of whoopee. You're in a good spot for it. Wonderful. I have only to wave a finger and I can satisfy my slightest whim. And I suppose if anybody says no, you put them right back in the cooler. Sure. Now, look, when court reconvenes, I'm going to try to put you in jail for a good long time. That's my business. But you haven't been convicted yet, so I don't see why you shouldn't enjoy Christmas like the rest of us. That's why I told Mike to get you out. And bring me up here. I did not tell him to bring you up here. Then why did that gorilla bring me up here? Because he's got a mind like a, like a sewer. You mean I don't have to stay here if I don't want to? You most certainly do not. Then I'll stay. <laughs> I just don't want to be forced. Now, wait a minute. You know, there's nothing as dangerous as a square shooter. If all men were like you, there wouldn't be any nice girls left. Yes, well, all this is leading into a very interesting subject that I haven't time to pursue at the moment. I'm going away on a little trip, and it's quite a drive. Oh, you mean you want me to go? Well, yes. Where? Where what? I mean, I was on my way to a nice, comfortable jail, three meals a day, turkey for Christmas, and now, well... Well, don't you live someplace? No. Well, where have you been living? In a tree? I had a room in a hotel, but they locked me out. Oh. Well, how much do you owe this hotel? A hundred and twenty-six dollars and forty cents. Oh. Well, that doesn't solve any problems. Why don't you just put me back in the clink? That solves a lot of problems. Well, for one thing, I'm not sure I can. And Well, that wasn't the idea. Have you had your dinner? Not yet. Come on, then. I'll buy you that Christmas dinner, and we'll figure something out. Rufus! Here's your hat, boss. Going out, huh? Yes, I am. I don't. But don't forget, you gotta go see your ma. Shut <laughs> up. You know, I was...
was thinking uh, I might lend you my apartment while I'm away. <laughs> that sounds like a play, doesn't it? Yeah, sounds like a flop. Don't worry about me. I can always chisel a hotel for a week or two. That's a nice, cheesy idea. Well, I'm not going to sleep in the subway. As far as the holiday's concerned, I guess I'll get plenty of that when you get through with me. Uh, not that I mean it in a disagreeable way, you understand? I understand. Your business is your business. Of course, some people wouldn't care for that kind of business. Somebody has to do the dirty work. Thanks. Just too bad it has to be somebody as nice as you. How long have you been swiping things? Long time. Have you been caught before? Just twice. Did you take things you didn't need? Sure. In the presence of beautiful things, did you did you feel a sudden irresistible urge to take them in your hands and hurry away with them? <laughs> you mean, was I hypnotized? No, I mean, maybe you're a kleptomaniac. No, they tried that. You see, to be a kleptomaniac, you can't sell any of the stuff afterwards, or you lose your amateur standing. I don't understand it. I don't think you ever could understand, because, well, your mind is different. Rights and wrongs aren't the same for everybody. They should be, but they just aren't. Oh, that's ridiculous. Is it? Try it like this. Suppose you were starving to death. Yes? And you didn't have any food and you didn't have any money. No. Yeah. And there was some loaves of bread out in front of a market and the man's back was turned. Would you swipe one? You bet I would. <laughs> well, that's because you're honest. You see, I'd have a six-course dinner at the restaurant across the street. Then I'd say I'd forgotten my purse. You get the difference? Yeah. I think your way is smarter. Oh, sure. Sure, we're smart. We're very smart. Well, if we're all finished... Uh, waiter, check, please. Right away, sir. Well, Miss Leander, I've got a couple of bucks extra I don't need. Enough for a room anyway and a couple of breakfasts. Thanks. Thanks a lot. You're checked, sir. Oh. Here you are. Oh, uh, will you ask the band to play my Indiana home? Yes, sir. Why do you want him to play that? Because that's where I'm going. No. Are you a Hoosier? Yeah, Wabash, Indiana. That is a farm just outside of Wabash. Wabash, Indiana. No wonder I liked you. I'm from Eltonville. No. Why, that's only about 50 miles yes, from Yes, sir. Well, I'll be down, and we had to come here and meet like this. <laughs> Funny, isn't it? So you're going back home, huh? Yeah. Yeah, I go home every Christmas. You do, huh? Gee, that... That's great. My mother still runs a farm. She does all right, too. Raises partridge, wine dots, Poland, China. Oh, we never had anything that swell. <laughs> we never did either till lately. How long since you've been home? Never. Why? I ran away. Oh. Well, I don't know what the circumstances were, of course. Not so hot. Well, time takes care of those things. Did they write to you? I, uh, I got a letter from my mother when my father died. Oh, your mother's alive, then. I hope so. That song, it's, it's awful pretty, isn't it? Mm. Kind of does things to you. Say, uh, look, how would you like to go home for Christmas? What? I mean it. I could drop you off at your place and pick you up on my way back. Home? Oh, gee, I don't know. Come on, it'll do you good. What do you say? Well, all right, unless, aren't you afraid? Afraid of what? How it might look, rising young district attorney and me. I didn't think of it. Say, you never think of anything wrong, do you? That's what makes you such a swell guy. Our stars, Gene Arthur and Fred McMurray, will be back in just a moment for Act Two of Remember the Night. Now, listen a minute with Sally and me. Do you remember how, to the strains of that well-loved music, familiar things came alive on Christmas Eve? How the wooden soldiers marched in the toy shop? Sugar Plum Fairy danced. If things only could come alive at Christmas time, it might solve a lot of problems. For girls like Anne, for instance. Anne's pretty. You'd think she'd be popular. But here it's two days before Christmas and she's crying herself to sleep because she hasn't a date for New Year's Eve. And she's not been asked to as many holiday parties as the other girls. Now, if only the lacy pink silk slip across the back of the chair in Anne's room could talk like this, 
And we're what's wrong, we under things. People notice if we're not always fresh and dainty. You mustn't take chances. We need to be luxed every night. Then you'd really be just as sweet and pretty and dainty as you look. It's so foolish to take chances with a thing as important as daintiness. Well, girls who do are apt to find themselves left out of things, missing out on romance. But Lux girls know what fun the holiday whirl can be. You're wonderful. Where have you been all my life? <laughs> Same old line. But isn't it fun to hear it? Lux girls do. And it's easy to be a Lux girl. Easy to avoid offending by luxing under things every night. Dresses, blouses, and sweaters often. New Quick Lux gives you suds so fast. Rich, gentle suds that just float away perspiration, yet keep fabrics and colors new looking longer. Lux is safe for anything safe in water alone. And it's so thrifty, a little goes so far. Get the generous big box of New Quick Lux first thing tomorrow morning. It comes in the same familiar package, it costs you no more. And one big box of Lux Flakes will do under things every night for weeks and weeks. Now, our producer, Mr. DeMille. Act two of Remember the Night, starring Gene Arthur as Lee Leander and Fred McMurray as Jack Sargent, with Beulah Bundy as Jack's mother. Westward, along the snow-banked highways from New York, more than 20 hours of steady driving have brought Lee Leander and Jack Sargent to Eltonville, Indiana, and the front gate of Lee's former home. A bright moon softens the outline of the ramshackle house that stands cold and dark on the outskirts of town. From within the house comes the warning wail of a dog as Jack swings the car up to the sagging front porch. This is it, huh? Well, all out, end of the line. Oh, please, let's wait till... Hey, my, my mother might not even live here anymore. Come on, now, don't be so nervous. Well, uh, will you... Will you go in with me? Sure, I'll go in with you. Come on, I've got your bag. You see that tree? Yeah. I fell out of it when I was 12. See, from that branch right up there. Landed on my head, too. <laughs> That's a better gag than hypnotism. Your lawyer should have used that. Come on, I'll smile. Here we are. Gee, uh, I didn't mean to knock so loud. Oh, that sounds like Mickey barking. Oh, no, but it couldn't be. Here's somebody coming. Yeah. Now, look, I'll pick you up on New Year's Day in the afternoon. Don't forget. No. Gee, you've been sweet. Will you shut up? Yes. Oh, oh, I'm terribly sorry. Doesn't Mrs. Malone live here? Oh, I, I guess you want my wife. Oh, I didn't know. Who is it, Henry? Somebody want me? Mama. Hello, Mom. Merry Christmas. Well, well, don't you know me? Come in. Uh, this is this is Mr. O Sergeant. How do you do? Sit down. Oh, you're you're looking fine, Mom. What'd you come here for? What do you want? I don't want anything. I, it was just Christmas, and Mr. Sergeant happened to be driving past you here. You see, I live in Wabash. I knew you'd be glad if she. Glad? Why should I be glad? Good riddance to bad rubbish, I said the day she left. Oh, Mama, please, Mr. Sergeant. Just like her father she was. Always laughing at serious things. Never doing what she's told till she winds up stealing. Stealing my mission money. Money I'd put by with the sweat of my brow, that's what. I didn't steal it. I told you a thousand times I only borrowed it. I was going to pay you back. But you didn't pay me back, did you? And you never paid me back. How could I after you called me a thief in front of the whole town? Nobody would give me a job. And you left here. The great lady. We weren't good enough for you. A decent home, a hard-working mother, and a crook for a daughter. Oh, Mom. Look, Lee, I don't want to tear you away, but we still have 50 miles to go. Oh. Are you ready? Oh, yes. It's been very interesting to meet you, Mrs. Uh... The name doesn't concern you. It most certainly does not. Come on, kid. I... I'd forgotten how much that woman hates me. And how much I hate her. It's a terrible thing to say, isn't it? No. But ever since I was little, she was always so right. And I was always so wrong. Thanks for 
for getting me out. I'll stay anywhere. Any old place will do. If I'm far enough away from her. No, take it easy. I wish I'd broken my neck when I fell out of that tree. It's a little, late, a little too late to think about that now, isn't it? You won't make me stay in Eltonville, will you? You'll find me a room somewhere else. Sure. Any old dump will do. That's just what you're going to get. It's got only one window, and the mattress is stuffed with rocks, and it's got a painting of the cross-eyedest old guy you ever saw in your life. <laughs> How do you know? How do I know what? That my grandfather was cross-eyed? You mean you're, you're taking me home with you? Why not? <gasps> oh. oh, now, for guys, come on, stop it. Stop it. Anyone home? John. John. Hello, Mother. Oh, my boy, my boy. Oh, gosh, Mother, it's good to see oh, you. Oh, my dear, I can't believe you're here at last. Well, John, sorry. Hello, Aunt Emmy. How about a kiss? Oh, I do declare I'm glad you're here. If only to stop your mother from taking leave of her senses. <laughs> boy, I'll say, hello, John. Welcome home. Hiya, Willie. The girl's still chasing you? <laughs> what made you so late, dear? We thought you'd be here by six at least. Hey, Who's that in the front seat, John? Oh, I'm sorry. Mother, this is Miss Lee Leander. She's come to spend Christmas with us. How do you do? Well, how nice. I'm glad to know you, my dear. And this is my Aunt Emmy. She knows more about flannel cakes than the guy who invented them. Hello. I'm right pleased to meet you, Miss Leander. And this is Willie Sims, a hired boy. He's crazy about the girls and the girls are... Well, this is Willie Sims. <laughs> I'm, ple <laughs> I'm pleased to meet you. Hello. I, I hope I won't be too much trouble, Mrs. Sargent. Trouble? Why, bless your child. It's a joy to have you here. No trouble at all. Sure, right? Not a speck. Come along, child. You must be near freezing to death, and here we are, cackling like... Emmy, huh? did you leave those cookies in the oven? Oh, oh jeepers creepers. Come along now, everyone. This way, Miss Leander. Thanks. Oh, boy, John. Huh? Ain't she a pizzerino? Who? Oh. <laughs> Hot dog. Come on, grab a grip, Willie. I want to thaw it in a hurry. Go on, John. Don't stop. Play that other piece you used to do so good. No, I can't remember it, Mother. Oh, well, try, dear. Don't you think he plays nice, Miss Leander? <laughs> you don't have to answer that. I had $14 worth of piano lessons one time, and they've never forgotten it. <laughs> Willie, hand me that popcorn. We gotta have it all strung for the tree tomorrow night. Here you are. Here, you can help me. You ain't done a thing all evening. Didn't I help Miss Leander with the dinner dishes? Should have done those yourself, Willie. Miss Leander's a guest. Oh, I like doing them, Mrs. Sargent. I've lived in hotels and places so long, I haven't been around a house as much as I'd like. Your folks dead? Willie, be quiet. Oh, I don't mind. My father's dead. My mother's remarried. Well, that's too bad, dear. I always say it's so hard on the children. It, it just isn't the same with a new parent. John, just one more piece. No, nope, that's all till next year, Aunt Emmy. Oh, dear. Uh, I'll play a piece if you want. Well, that'd be fine. Can you play? Well, I, I used to play a little. What would you all like? It doesn't make any difference. I can sing Silent Night. Now, Willie. Well, I can. Uh, Silent Night, I think I remember it. Well, let's all sing it. Go ahead, Miss Leander. went up long ago. Mother, uh, wait. There's one thing you must be curious about. What, dear? Miss Leander. Yes? I, uh, I don't know whether to tell you this or not, but 
I don't like to bring somebody under your roof without you knowing exactly who she is. Oh, John, I think I can guess. Huh? Oh, no, no, not at all. This young woman isn't even a friend of mine. Well, she certainly should be. I think she's charming. She is charming, Mother. She reminds me of your father's cousin, Winifred. I was saying to Emmy tonight... Wait a minute, Mother. The girl's a crook. I'm going to put her in jail when we get back to New York. What? But in the meanwhile, she had no place to go for Christmas. So... Why, the poor lamb. You'll do no such thing, John Sargent. Why, that girl's as honest as all outdoors. I can tell by just looking at her face. If she did take some little thing, well, I'm sure it was entirely by mistake. She's probably a, a hypochondriac. <laughs> yeah, she, she might be at that, Mother. She hasn't really taken things now, has she, dear? You're just making a bad joke, aren't you? No, Mother. And I'm afraid this isn't even her first offense. But that doesn't mean she wasn't unhappy and lonely and a human being like the rest of us. Well, the poor thing probably didn't get enough love as a child. Do you remember how bad you were? Well, you weren't really bad, but do you remember the time you took my egg money I was going to get a new dress with? And then how hard you worked to pay it back when you understood? You made me understand. No, dear. It was love that made you understand. Well, I do hope she enjoys her stay here. Do you think we ought to lock up the silver? No, I don't think it's necessary. <laughs> Good night, son. Good night, Mother. Oh, look at all the presents, y'all. And my dear, I've never seen so many presents in all my life. Here's another one for you, Mother. <laughs> for me? We always open our presents on Christmas Eve, Miss Leander, ever since John grew up. Oh, John, another bottle of perfume. <laughs> ecstasy, too. Well, I haven't even started on that bottle of ecstasy you gave me last year. Lucy. What? Oh, oh, oh. Well, gee, we've got all our stuff open and... Uh... Well, I'm sorry about the present situation, Miss Leander. If we'd only known sooner... Well, John, there's some presents for Miss Leander over there on the sofa. Huh? Of course, Jack. You must have forgotten. Oh. Oh. Well, I guess you can always trust Santa Claus. Uh, three packages, Miss Leander. Merry Christmas. Oh, no. Oh, you, you shouldn't have gone to all that trouble. Open them up now, dear. Oh, what a lovely pincushion. Oh, it's so pretty. <laughs> Nothing at all, just scraps and things I've been collecting for years. Well, here's the next one. A very Merry Christmas to Miss Leander from Jack's Aunt Emma. Wow. Stockings. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, bed socks. Uh, not so fancy, but wonderful on a cold night for a spinster lady. <laughs> oh, it's awfully sweet of you all. Here's another, Miss Leander. Not really. Uh, who's that from, Willie? <laughs> From you, you big dunce. From Can't me? you remember anything? Oh, boy, I didn't... Reach your sakes, Jack. Keep quiet. Perfume? Oh, thank you. Oh, it's nothing. Just a bottle of perfume. <laughs> An ecstasy, too. Yeah, that's right. Oh, you're all much too kind. I, I don't think I've ever met anyone so thoughtful. Oh, and... nonsense, child. We're so happy to have you and so anxious for you to enjoy your stay. Of course, there isn't much to do here, except tonight we're having a caroling party, and Thursday's the charity bazaar, and we have a treasure hunt on Friday, and then we start resting up for New Year's Eve. See, that's all there is. You know, farmers' wives don't die of boredom anymore. They die of heart failure. <laughs> <laughs> I do declare this is the best caroling we've ever had. Yes. They look nice together, don't they? Who? Jack and Miss Leander. Like they was made for each other. <clears throat> now, if, if you're hinting that John's in love with her, well, he isn't any. Fiddlesticks, Lucy. Fiddlesticks. She's in love with him, too. I tell you, they're not. You don't know anything about these things, Emmy. They're not in love. They just can't be. Oh, no, it's wonderful. 
Well, just the same, we'd better get along home. We've got a long week ahead. Long? I imagine it's going to seem pretty short. almost over, isn't it? Yeah, it's almost over. The second will be one day nearer. The second? Oh, you mean that second. When my case comes up again. Yeah, I, I hadn't thought of it. I have. But you, you've all been so sweet. No matter what happens after we get back, it, it won't matter so much. I'll have some wonderful memories. So will I. I have the honor to wish you all a very happy New Year! Happy New Year, Lee. Happy New Year, Jack. You know, it's, a, it's an old-fashioned custom, but people always kiss each other, well, at this time. I know it. Well, what am I waiting for? I don't know. Why are you? Just a minute. Oh, Mrs. Sargent. I'm sorry to disturb you, Miss Leander, but you'll be in such a rush in the morning. Oh, you're not disturbing me. Come in. Thank you. First of all, I want you to know how glad we are to have had you here and how much I hope you've enjoyed your stay. Oh, you'll never know how much. And then, <clears throat> well, I, I want you to know how sorry I am you're in trouble and how much I hope it'll all come out all right. Oh, I... I didn't know you knew about that. Oh, you poor child. You can be sure I never would have mentioned it now, only... Well, has Jack ever told you anything about his childhood? No. Why? We were very poor after my husband died. In fact, we had nothing. Jack had to do the chores before school and after, and then after the chores, he studied in the evening so he could go to college... And then he had to work his way through college and through law school. Oh, I don't mean there's anything unusual about it. I'm only trying to tell you that he worked very hard to get where he is. Very, very hard. And he's my son. And I wouldn't want anything or anyone to spoil it for him now. I see. But I don't see why anything should spoil it for him, do you? He's in love with you. Oh, but he isn't in love with me. He's never had any more interest in me than, than some panhandler he'd buy a meal for. Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. He kissed you tonight. Well, well, I'm, I'm not ugly. Oh, he might have had a little fever for me, but it isn't going any further. Hasn't been any place either. I see. He's no fool. Even if he was, I, I wouldn't hurt him. Or you, or Aunt Emmy, or even Willie. Thank you, my dear. And good night. But you do love him, don't you? I, uh, I'm afraid so. I knew you did. Good night, my dear. <laughs> Pause now for station identification. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. After a brief intermission, Mr. DeMille presents Act Three of Remember the Night, starring Gene Arthur and Fred McMurray. But now, let's look ahead to that magic moment on Christmas Eve.
when the Christmas tree stands fragrant in the corner. A star gleams at the top and... Now, John, let's turn on the tree lights. Oh! Oh, oh Mommy, it's beautiful, beautiful! Just like a tree in the fairy story, covered with snow that doesn't ever melt. Yes, a fairy tale tree with frosty snow on its branches. Snow that will stay white and lovely right in your living room for the whole holiday season. Because it's made from the same pure white Lux flakes that you use for washing all your pretty things. It's so easy to make this Lux snow. Here's what you do. Empty a large box of Lux flakes into a big bowl. Gradually add to it two cups of warm water, beating the mixture with an egg beater until it looks like rich whipped cream. Then you pick it right up in your hands and spread it along the branches with your fingers so it looks just like real snow. If you like, you can sprinkle some shiny artificial snow on top of the Lux snow while it's still damp so it will catch the light. We put some of the Lux snow on the reeds in our windows, too. And I made a stunning centerpiece for our table. Pine branches covered with Lux snow in a low vase and hung with tiny ornaments we hadn't used on the tree. It makes our dining room look so Christmassy. Oh, Mommy, let's put some snow branches on the table in the front hall. I think that would be lovely. Particularly lovely if they're in front of a mirror so you can see their reflection, too. Now, remember, to make Lux snow for your tree or table decorations, use two cups of warm water to each large box of Lux flakes. Beat the mixture with an egg beater until it looks like thick whipped cream. Then spread it with your fingers along the branches. Be sure to get the large size box of Lux flakes and ask your dealer for printed directions for making Lux snow. Now, Mr. DeMille returns to the microphone. The curtain rises on the third act of Remember the Night. The holidays are over, and Jack Sargent is taking Lee back to New York to stand trial for robbery. The road takes them across the border into Canada, there, Jack brings the car to a sudden stop. What's the idea of stopping? Lee, do you know where we are? Of course, we're in Canada. No, you don't get it. Look, this is Canada. Over there's the United States. Stay here. Don't go back. Stop talking nonsense. It isn't nonsense. I'm not a policeman. I can't make you go. Is your conscience gnawing at you? What do you think it was when I got bail for you? Oh, that seems like 80 years ago. I didn't even know you were against me. Oh, I knew you were supposed to be trying to put me in jail, but you were so gentle about it. Yeah, that's part of the technique. If you don't treat a woman with kid gloves, every man on the jury wants to punch you on the nose. And you have to handle a jury with kid gloves, too, or you'll get it right in the verdict. You know, it's very hard to put a woman in jail, no matter what she's done. I'm supposed to be kind of a specialist at it. Oh, no, you're not. Sure I am. You're just trying to make me hate you, so you won't feel too bad when you give me the business, aren't Look, you? Are you going to stay in Canada? A fine district attorney you are, telling me to jump bail. You know I love you, don't you? Don't say that. And you love me. No. I suppose that's why you've looked at me the way you have, and kissed me the way you did, and why your hand has always found mine, and mine has always found yours when they were anywhere near each other. Jack, don't be a fool. You've got to remember how hard you've worked to get where you are. You've got to think of the hours and the days and the years you spent getting through college right, and... Mother's been talking to you. Why shouldn't she? She's got everything to be proud of. And you've got to be proud and think about it, too, instead of telling people to jump bail and falling for the first pair of pretty eyes Lee, that... I love you. Oh, Jack. I love you. Darling, it'll be awful hard to lose you. You know what I wish? What? I wish the case was over and you'd been acquitted. Then you shouldn't have had it postponed. Oh, that's true. But if I hadn't, I'd never have met you. That's true. So the case is dismissed and you've been acquitted. Knock wood. And I pull out a marriage license. Oh, gee. And we march right into the judge's chambers and have him marry us. You know you're talking like a madman, don't you? Yeah. Yeah, sure. Come on, let's go. <laughs> Jack, the courtroom's less than a block away. Or don't you care if the jury and the rest of them see you with me? Oh, so I'm not good enough to be seen with you, huh? You don't love me anymore. I never loved you. Aha, were you just toying with me then? Oh, shut up. You'll have to develop more courtesy and respect for your future husband, or I shall fall back on strong measures. A woman, a dog, a hickory tree, the better you beat them, the better they be. 
Oh, quit, will you? All right. I can't argue with you. Imagine being married to a man who argues for a living. But you know all this isn't right. Can't you see the papers? District attorney marries girl crook. I'd only hurt you, Jack. Yeah, but you won't be a crook. You'll be acquitted. How do you know? Well, I don't know, but I think you've got a good chance. You wouldn't do anything to make them acquit me, would you? What could I do? I don't know, but you could throw the case if you... Well, listen, you're being charged by a judge and a jury. You're being tried by a judge and a jury. They know the facts and they speak for themselves. There's nothing I can do about it. Not a thing. Well, I hope there isn't. It'd be a fine thing, wouldn't it? Now, don't worry. So long, darling. I'll see you in court. You may proceed, Mr. Sergeant. Thank you, Your Honor. I will if this jury will let me. They've been mumbling to themselves all morning. I'll take care of the jury, Mr. Sergeant. Thank you. Now, Miss Leander, I believe you have testified that you were hypnotized at the time you left the jewelry store and walked up Fifth Avenue. Didn't you? I... I... Did you or didn't you? Answer the question, Miss Leander. Well, my lawyer said so. Oh, your lawyer said so. Are we to understand, then, that you and your lawyer do not agree as to exactly what happened? Don't answer that question. Object, Your Honor. The question's entirely improper, and I ask it be stricken from the record. Sustain. The jury will disregard the question. I was only trying to... Your Honor, those jurors are at it again. If they'd listened to the testimony rather than whispering among themselves... Proceed with the case, please. Well, you can't hear yourself think. Well, Miss Leander, were you hypnotized or weren't you? I... I suppose I... We don't want your suppositions. We wanted to know whether or not you were hypnotized. Yes. Yes what? I... I guess I was hypnotized. You guess you were hypnotized. First you suppose you were hypnotized, now you guess you were. Kindly remember you're under, under oath. Do you know the penalty for perjury? Object, Your Honor. Sustained. Tell me, Miss Leander, just how many times have you been hypnotized by beautiful jewelry? I... Uh, I guess quite a lot of times. Did you hear by any chance Dr. Kindman's opinion concerning hypnotism? Well... I... I'm trying to think. I... You don't treat a woman with kid gloves. Every man on the jury wants to punch you on the nose. Oh. Will the witness please answer my question? And will the jury please stop mumbling? Jack, you... And you have to handle the jury with kid gloves, too. You'll get it right in the verdict. He's my son. It's all right. It's all right, Miss Leander. Just take all the time you want. He's worked so hard. I wouldn't want anything to spoil it for him now. Well, Miss Leander? Nothing must spoil it for him. Well, Miss Leander, what is it? What oh. is it? Your Honor, I object to the tactics oh. being pursued by the district attorney. He's harrying the defendant. No, no, wait. Wait, I want to plead guilty. Your Honor, I don't believe this young woman is well. I, I request a five-minute recess. I want to plead guilty. Your Honor, it must be perfect. Your Honor, a, a few minutes recess, please. She's obviously not responsible for what she's saying. Why do you wish to plead guilty? Because I am guilty. You see, when you work hard for something and promises are made... You just can't toss it away, no matter what. Your Honor, it must be perfectly clear now that this is not normal behavior. It's perfectly clear, of course. And the state has no desire to take advantage of a temporary aberration. There isn't anything temporary about this. Your Honor, you can see I'm in my right mind. I plead guilty. You leave me no other alternative. The court at this time will fix January 7th at 10 a.m. as the day for passing sentence. The prisoner is remanded to the city jail. The jury is dismissed. Mr. Sergeant, to see you, Miss Leander. All right. This way, Mr. Sergeant. Ten minutes. Thanks. Hello? Do you know what you've done? Yes. Do you know it can't be undone? Yes. You understand, there's no appeal. Nothing but jail. How long will I get? How do I know? Maybe not very long, but if you'd kept your trap shut, you wouldn't be in here at all. There wasn't anything else to do. You're so strong, and you argue so well, and I love you so much. Yeah, you certainly proved that. I'd always do what you wanted, even if it wasn't good for you. I'd never have a chance against you. You'd never have a chance with me, like just now, when you were trying to lose the case. Aren't you ashamed? Stop it. Oh, I know what you were trying to do. Save little Jackie's career from the bad, bad woman. Don't you think I'm the best judge of what's good for me and what I want most in this world? No. And while you were making your big gesture, did you stop to think how much you'd be hurting me? Do you think I'll stop loving you just because they lock you up with a bunch of hoodlums and hopheads for the next few years? I'm not much better. Well, you, 
You were good enough for me. Will you come and see me? Come and see you. I'm going to send for the judge and marry you right this minute. Oh, no. Thanks. But, but if you still wanted me afterwards, you'd be a sucker if you did. But if you did, it wouldn't be the same. I'd be all square and, and you'd have plenty of time to think things over. I don't have to think, Lee. I'll be waiting for you. No matter how long it is, I'll be waiting. Jack, will you stand beside me and hold my hand when I'm sentenced? You know I will. Then I won't be afraid. It'll be kind of like a marriage at that, won't it? You see, the other part won't be so bad or so long with your voice always in my ear, your smile always before my eyes, and the feel of your hand always in mine. Lee. I love you so. I love you so. Mr. DeMille will bring our stars back to the microphone in just a moment for their curtain calls. And now it's nearly time to trim the trees, to light the Christmas candles and hang the Christmas stocking by the chimney with care. Well, here's hoping Santa tucks into them the very things that you want the most. We've learned that one of the things most of you ladies want the most to find tucked in your Christmas stocking is stockings. And if you're lucky and Christmas brings you some precious silks and nylons, you'll treasure them, I know. That means giving them the care over 90% of the makers of stockings recommend, Lux Flakes. Nightly luxing saves the elasticity that keeps filmy stockings from breaking into runs so easily. Helps them fit better, too. You know, it's downright extravagant to risk cake soap rubbing or soaps with harmful alkali. These weaken elasticity and runs pop sooner. And now, for this Christmas, lots of luck to you. And for your precious stockings, lots of lux. Now, here's Mr. DeMille with our stars. Our stars are in the spotlight again as they take a curtain call. And those special guests we told you about, Bob Hope and Rita Hayworth, will join us in a moment. But right now, we give our best grade A salute to Jean Arthur and Fred McMurray. Thank you, Mr. DeMille. And may I be the first to wish you and your audience a Merry Christmas? I'll second that wish, C.B. Hmm, the same to you. And I know I speak for our audience. There's something else that goes with this season of the year that I hope no one will forget. I mean, the Red Cross. American women have always been generous with their time in helping the Red Cross, but there's a special job for the men now, C.B. That five-letter word, money. That'll stand repeating, Fred. The Red Cross needs money. Fifty million dollars, to be exact, for the Special War Relief Fund. We all know the need is great, but it must be impressed on us that the time is short. So I hope that everyone will give as much and as soon as, as they can. America has never failed the Red Cross yet, Jean. It won't fail them now. But besides money, from what Mrs. DeMille tells me, every local chapter needs help from every woman. Yes, there's a mountain of work to be done. And the place to volunteer for it is at your local Red Cross headquarters. Well, I, I guess everybody is wondering what happened to Bob Hope and Rita Hayworth. Where are they, CB? <laughs> right over there, standing in the wings. Come on out, Bob and Rita. Hello, everybody. <laughs> Hello, knit two, pearl two, knit two, pearl two. What goes on here, Bob? <laughs> well, I've been listening to Jean Arthur talk about the Red Cross, so I'm knitting a sock. One sock? <laughs> what for? <laughs> That's for W.C. Fields. He wants something to wear over his nose during blackouts. <laughs> Seriously, I want to tell all of you how much I enjoyed the play tonight. Thank you, Rita. And we have a very pleasant assignment ahead of us right now. Suppose you explain it, Mr. DeMille. Gladly. The Hollywood news photographers have asked us to give Bob and Rita an award on their behalf. Photographers? Oh, that must be a beauty contest. <laughs> yes, Rita is lovely, lovely, and I presume they finally saw me in Technicolor. Technicolor. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Yes, your, your new picture, Louisiana Purchase, is in Technicolor, isn't it? Well, I guess Paramount figured they had to do something. But the, 
<laughs> but uh, Columbia didn't have to worry about Rita Hayworth. No, this is not an award for your beauty, Bob, believe it or not. The truth is, Bob, that Hollywood news reporters have picked you and Rita as the most photogenerous people of the year in Hollywood. And they've, they've sent over these silver trophies and asked Jean and Fred and me to present them to you tonight. Naturally, we feel very proud of that. We all know that Hollywood news photographers have helped many young players along the road to stardom. And so an award from them is a coveted honor. On behalf of all these cameramen... To you, Bob, <laughs> and to you, Rita, we offer congratulations on your photo generosity. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mr. DeMille. Isn't that lovely? It's so pretty and bright. Yes, and you can always keep it bright with pepsidant, yes. <laughs> Bob, remember where you are. <laughs> okay, okay, Rita, you can use a little Lux on it, too. <laughs> Don't, don't soft soap me, Bob. <laughs> don't soft soap me just because we're expecting great things from you next week. You see, ladies and gentlemen, next Monday night, the stars of the Lux Radio Theater will be Bob Hope and Hedy Lamar. Uh, the Bride Came C.O.D., Jean. <laughs> it's, it's adapted from the Warner Brothers picture. The story of an aviator who kidnaps an heiress. That's Bob Hope kidnapping Hedy Lamar. <laughs> Don't wake me up. Let me dream. Well, <laughs> we'll see you next week. Oh, well, sounds like a great comedy, C.B. Good night. Good night. Gee, this award makes me feel so good, I want to invite all of you to come with me as my guest for the evening. Uh, no, no, no thanks, Bob. We've already seen nothing but the truth. <laughs> Good night. Good night. Remember the night made this a night to remember. On this Monday night every year, we've brought you the Christmas greetings of this theater and the sincere good wishes of our sponsor. We do so again this year. For although these are serious times, that doesn't mean that America won't celebrate Christmas. The very first mini meaning of this sacred season is a promise of new hope and a new day to come. And so on this 22nd night of December in 1941, America looks with confidence to the day when right shall triumph and peace on earth shall reign again. Our sponsors, the makers of Lux Flakes, join me in inviting you to be with us again next Monday night when the Lux Radio Theater presents Hedy Lamar and Bob Hope in The Bride Came C.O.D. This is Cecil B. DeMille saying good night to you from Hollywood. <laughs> Fred McMurray is currently seen in the Paramount picture, New York Town. The picture, Remember the Night, was based on an original screenplay by Preston Sturgis, who recently wrote and directed Sullivan's Travels. Bob Hope's new Paramount picture is Louisiana Purchase. Rita Hayworth is currently starring with Fred Astaire in You'll Never Get Rich, and is working in the 20th Century Fox picture, My Gal Sal. Beulah Bondi is now appearing in the Warner Brothers picture, One Foot in Heaven. Heard in tonight's play were Verna Felton as Aunt Emma, Felix Valley as Willie, Arthur Q. Bryan as O'Leary, Griff Barnett as Judge, Buck Woods as Rufus, and Warren Ash, B. Benedaret, Edward Marr, Edwin Max, Lee Millar, Charles Seal, Bernard Zandel, and Audrey Reynolds. Tune in next Monday night to hear Bob Hope and Hedy Lamar in The Bride Came C.O.D. Our music was directed by Louis Silvers, and your announcer has been Melville Ruick. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs> <laughs>